Hey, friend, this is a special episode of the Renaissance English History Podcast. It is Adrian Dillard at TudorCon 2023 talking about George Boleyn and his advancement of the Henrician Religious Reformation. So I've released some clips of this before, but I don't think I've ever released the whole talk. And I'm going to start releasing some of the TudorCon talks from previous TudorCons to give you a taste of what TudorCon is like. Uh, We only have like six or seven tickets left for the in-person part of it. But in June, I'll start selling the tickets for the streaming ticket. You can watch online, be part of it. We've got an active community. We still have the costume contest. We still have um, trivia, all kinds of fun stuff for streamers to make it really immersive, um, more than just watching, watching it online. So anyway, you'll hear more about that as we get closer to June when those tickets go on sale. But for now, enjoy Adrian Dillard talking about George Boleyn, the complete, uh, the complete talk. She is fantastic. I'm a huge fan of Adrian. Ever since I read her first book on Jane Boleyn, I've been a fan. So I hope you enjoy and thanks for watching slash listening. All right. Bye. I know you guys thought I was going to talk about Holbein, but <laughs> we're going to talk about George. Um, so as some of you who follow me online know, I started my master's program. So I'm going to get my master's degree in history, which is something I've always wanted. But it does take up a lot of time, especially when you have a full time job and you're trying to write and trying to run a publishing company. and so poor Holbein had to go back, you know, to the to the back of the stove because I I wanted to um a lot of times I think we don't necessarily know all of the the extra things that go into academic history. You know, we read a lot of popular history, we watch a lot of popular history on TV, which is informed by academic work. But when you do things in an academic situation, you have peer review, you have, you know, all of these other things that you, you um, have to take into consideration in your writing. But also one of the things that you do as an academic is you can present a paper. So basically I am going to present to you a paper that I wrote for my British history class. I chose this one in particular because my professor said it was a really good paper and he does not give compliments lightly. And so I almost had a little mini heart attack when I read that. Um, So when you present a paper, there really isn't um, room for asides. So I just want to kind of set the scene for you a little bit before I I do this paper with you. One of the things that I'm going to talk about, and I posted this on social media, is that in writing this paper, researching it, I actually found, uh, like, I kind of discovered a little morsel of history that I hadn't made the connections to. And it's become one of my favorite um, research discoveries because it's not... It's never talked about. So as, you know... A lot of people who are familiar with the Boleyn family know um, it's often said that Jane and George had a, had an unhappy marriage. And one of the things that they use as evidence for that is this manuscript that uh, George had in his possessions when he was executed. And it's now housed in the British Library. And I got to see it. And it was amazing. Um, but it's called the torments of marriage, (laughs) right? And so we think like, oh my gosh, this is like some kind of funny joke, wedding joke that he received. But actually one of the things that's left out is that this book is made up of two manuscripts. And one of them is a translation of, it's called the Lamentations of Matthiolus. And that is the torments of marriage. And so in this poem that uh, Matthiolus wrote is basically he talks about how women are just the most horrid creatures ever. And marriage is like the worst state you could ever find yourself in because women are changeable and they're they're sneaky and they're liars and they're awful. 
Um, and so to give you a little background on this, <clears throat> this was written in the 1300s. And then Christine de Paisan, who some of you may be familiar with, she was also from the 1300s. She read this, this poem, and of course, it being a woman, it really struck her as, as very unfair and biased. And she was really one of the first kind of feminist writers who, who was female during the medieval period. And she went on to influence a lot of women, most notably Margaret of Austria, which is where Anne Boleyn spent her formative years in the court of Margaret of Austria. So she would have been very familiar with Christine de Paisan and her teachings and it, Margaret of Austria really ran her court in in a similar fashion to to kind of the preachings of Christine de Paisan. So Christine, when she after she read Mathiolus's book, she wrote her own book called The Book of the City of Ladies. And in this, she's having this sort of like uh, a fever dream, kind of like Heather had, <laughs> of where, you know, she falls asleep reading it and she wakes up and she wakes up with this really negative view of women. But then God comes to her and says, I am choosing you to, to go out and refute this writing. And so she writes this book, which is very kind of similar to Thomas More's Utopia. And it's basically this, this city that protects the women. And so in the book of the City of Ladies, she writes all of these different st stories about feminist heroes, heroines. And so um, the source for that was Boccaccio's Declaris Maloribus. So she's influenced by this, this really old style biography. And the connection with this that I, I find that was my favorite to realize is that you have Anne at the court of Margaret of Austria, and she's learning all these very feminist teachings, right? And then somehow this book that has so there was uh, Johan de Lefebvre. He was a, um, a French writer. He translated the Lamentations. And then he, in the style of Christine de Paisan, who heavily influenced him, he wrote his own similar to Book of the City of Ladies called uh, Le Livre de Lys, which is the Book of Gladness. And so it also is a refutation of this horrible misogynistic poem. And this is the book that George has. So the manuscript has the Lamentations, but it also has the Book of Gladness. So very often historians have, have left out this, this second manuscript, um, which I think says a lot about George Boleyn is that he actually had very feminist leading, leanings. And I'm going to talk about it in this story or in this paper. But um, the connections that I'm making is that, you know, Anne, she, she was kind of, we see her as, as feminist for her time. And for this education that she came also went to George Boleyn. And, and he had the same, the same idea ideas and the same passions. And this book, so inspired by the Book of the City of Ladies, which in turn was inspired by the Declaris Melribus. Now, if you've read Julia Fox's book on Jane Boleyn, which is what my novel on Jane Boleyn is mostly based off of, um, her father, Jane Boleyn's father, Lord Morley, he translated Boccaccio's Declaris Maloribus. And there is a theory that the way in which he translated one of the women's stories is, is in memory of his executed daughter. So those connections to me are just really fascinating because you're seeing that like 
Morley also had those same kind of beliefs. And so the union of Jane and George starts to make a whole lot more sense when you see that so many of their beliefs were similar of their families and how they raised their daughters and how they educated their daughters. And so anyways, that was my favorite research connection. So now I'm going to present my paper. On a gray spring morning in 1536, George Boleyn was led across the dew-soaked grass to a scaffold on Tower Hill. Sentenced to die under trumped-up charges of treason and incest, the ardent reformer faced the gathering crowd. After an acknowledgment of his sins, George offered a, lex a last exhortation. Men do come and say that I have been a setter forth of the word of God, and one that have favored the gospel of Christ. And because I would not that God's word should be slandered by me, I say unto you all that if I had followed God's word indeed, as I did read it and set it forth to my power, I had not come to this. It made for a poignant, if unsurprising, ending. The courtier known for his reformist beliefs chose his last moments on earth to extol one of the movement's clearest tenets. He was indeed a setter forth of the gospel in more ways than just this final speech. George Boleyn's promotion of Protestant ideals via the spread of religious books, his presentation to convocation, and diplomatic assignments abroad served to influence Henry VIII and advance the king's efforts to disconnect from the pope and establish the Anglican Church. The prior century's advent of the printing press, along with diminishing book prices and increasing literacy rates, enabled religious philosophers to transmit their works to reformers like George more efficiently than ever before. As the middle class expanded, demand for religious tracts in the vernacular grew, and progressive scholars were only too happy to fill the need. As these books and pamphlets filtered out of the cities and into nearby villages and towns, they began to spread across the continent. Religious leaders sought to curb the distribution of what they saw as dangerous, heretical books with suppression acts. But intrepid reformers rose to the challenge, finding new ways to smuggle their goods off the mainland and into the hands of England's burgeoning crop of anti-clericals. Just how these books found their way into the Boleyn Library is unclear. Regardless of its origination, one of the pamphlets entered the king's possession and left an indelible mark. Through Simon Fish's work, A Supplication for the Beggars, George Boleyn encouraged Henry VIII's mind toward the idea of breaking with Rome. History has credited Anne Boleyn for the king's consumption of supplication, but the idea originated with her brother. Martyrologist John Fox recounts George's earnest plea for his sister to share the tract with her paramour. The king was so taken by Fish's condemnation of the clergy's idleness and exploitation, he couldn't bear to part with the pamphlet for several days. Fish argued the church's power was such it did not matter what laws the king made against the clergy. The pope could simply overrule them. The church wielded control over the people and thus the country. For Henry to reclaim his sovereignty, he needed to weaken the church's influence. Faced with an uphill battle against the pontiff for his divorce, the king welcomed this view as a possible way out of his troubles. George further promoted the cause of the Reformation by translating evangelical works into English for the indoctrination of Queen Anne's ladies, transforming the royal household into a conduit for reform. Your most loving and friendly brother sendeth greetings, he wrote in his dedication of the Ecclesiastes. Paired alongside his translation of Jacques Lefebvre de Topps, Epistres et Evangiles, <laughs> De Sicant et du Setma de l'An, these two sumptuously decorated manuscripts preached reformist doctrine and were meant to be displayed in the Queen's rooms 
so her ladies could read and take instruction from the teachings contained within. Queen Anne was well acquainted with Lefebvre de Top through her childhood in the French court and emphatically agreed with his view on the saving role of faith in Christ and the evils inherent in the church. Despite increasingly restrictive laws and heretical books, the queen consistently imported them from abroad for public display. She required her ladies to read and conform. And this is the said book. Beyond the confines of scripture, George contributed to the progress of English culture by circulating pro-feminine themed books among an inner circle of prominent young men at court. Housed in the British Library today, the 15th century manuscript of Les Lamentations de Matthiolus and Les Lives de Lys still contains traces of its route through court poet Thomas Wyatt and the popular musician Mark Smeaton. Smeaton's inappropriate exchanges with Queen Anne during the weeks prior to their execution supports the assertion that George bequeathed the book as an entreaty for the musician to amend his ways. While Lamentations was notoriously misogynistic, Vive de Lis, the rebuttal by Johann de Lefebvre, argued against women's alleged fickleness and cruelty. Lefebvre was inspired by Christine de Paisan's The Book of the City of Ladies, a feminist treatise that celebrated women's rights to education and respect and their ability to rule. De Paisan's teachings had been deeply ingrained in Queen Anne from an early age. While she taught it in her household, George spread it throughout the ranks of men with the potential to codify it into law. My listeners, note well this point, his inscription urged readers. The new quashes the old way of thought. George's knowledge of scripture and his ability to successfully argue its points as a representative of the king directly aided the passing of the Act of Supremacy. Though it entered the law books three years after George's 1531 appearance at Convocation, the legislative meeting of church leadership, it was the courtier's proposed addendum, as far as the law of Christ allows, that swayed the clergy into submission to the king's supremacy. George arrived at Convocation armed with religious tracts he wrote based upon the king's own work, the glass of truth, and the Collectania Satis Copiosa, which supported the king's position. Both provided divine sanction for the title Henry desired, supreme head of the English church. George's speech still exists as the Rochford Manuscript. In this, the courtier served not only as a theological scholar, but also as the king's propagandist. Convocation would not be his only parliamentary appearance. George Boleyn's high rate of attendance during the Reformation Parliament of 1529 to 1536 ensured his input and influence upon nearly every major piece of reform legislation. Indeed, he claimed the second highest attendance for a lawmaker. And amongst his many returns was the 1533 meeting that outlawed appeals to Rome. Additionally, George submitted votes for acts which saw the transfer of authority from the Pope to the King, the right of the Anglican Church to make dispensations, and the investiture of the succession of his niece, Elizabeth. The act of succession was a particularly sharp weapon in the King's arsenal. Everyone in the realm was required to pledge an oath renouncing foreign authority, including that of Rome. It also required recognition of the validity of King Henry's marriage to George's sister and the legitimacy of their heirs. To abstain was a treasonable offense that meant imprisonment or death. <laughs> you know, I had to put something funny in there. <laughs> Henry VIII used George to evangelize his radical reforms and gather support for them in foreign courts. 
Throughout the last seven years of George's life, he was sent to entreat the King of France no less than five times. In his first mission to France, the young courtier was attended by a theologian, John Stokesley, called the Great Enemies of the Catholic Queen Catherine of Aragon by Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis. The pair were told to insert themselves into Francois I's meeting with the Pope. They were also instructed to negotiate with the French universities in their ruling on the merits of King Henry's divorce. George, and later his father, leaned on the Sorbonne to deliver a favorable response, and eventually they did. The success of George's initial foray into diplomatic duty fed King Henry's increasing trust in the courtier, which led to even more influential assignments. In 1533, he was employed to deliver news of the royal marriage and the impending birth of its heir. This was a delicate matter, for Henry had acted directly against papal authority. There would be consequences. Francois I met George with far stronger resistance this time. The French king would not cancel his meeting with the pontiff, nor would he put his name to the letter composed by Henry for delivery to Rome. Using considerable skill that was later remarked upon by the bamboozled French diplomats, George negotiated a compromise in only four days. Francois instructed his representatives in Rome to encourage the Pope to void the bull summoning Henry to the legatine court. Francois's representatives were ultimately unsuccessful, but George earned a begrudging respect for his skills of persuasion and his obstinacy. The French monarch sent him home with 2,000 credits for his efforts. George's carefully cultivated relationship with Francois I and his court cemented the courtier's position as Henry VIII's official spokesman on religious matters in France. With the Pope's bull of excommunication in force against Henry, the monarch wasted no time sending his best envoy back to France for assurances against further reprisals. Once again, Francois pre prevaricated. He would not break with the Pope as he did not see himself as Rome's ally. However, he would agree to a friendly meeting to discuss matters with his brother and scepter as Henry. Anne's pregnancy threw a wrench in their plans, George was again returned to France to smooth the way. These delicate diplomatic dances show how adeptly George preached King Henry's gospel of supremacy and plucked reasonable compromises from royal leaders least disposed to make waves with the Catholic Church. George's commitment to scripture and desire for reform led him to seek assistance from a group of Protestant princes in his efforts to spread the gospel among his countrymen. This powerhouse band of German Protestant leaders called the Schmalkaldic League worked to secure independence from Rome with the ultimate goal of replacing the Holy Roman Empire. In early 1534, George joined a handful of Protestant English nobles in petitioning the League to send ambassadors to their court. They wanted these representatives to convince the king to go further than mere independence from Rome. They sought the wholesale remaking of the church, or, barring that, the advancement of God's glory in the land and among the king's people, particularly those who are around him. George lobbied hard for a visit by one of their leaders, Lutheran theologian Philip Melanchthon. It never grew to fruition, but the mutual admiration was such the League became outraged by George and Anne's execution and further negotiations with England stalled after their death. This is, um, it's the Schmalkaldic League's, uh, it, I don't remember exactly what, what is in it, but it is all of the, the things that you see at the bottom are the seals of the men who were in the Schmalkaldic League. So I believe that this was something that was sent to Henry and proposition of them coming over to England. Yeah. 
In addition to his diplomatic duties, George used his appointment as Lord Warden of the Sank Ports to wield judicial influence over those in opposition to his program of re reform. So I have to stop and say this letter is something that I found. I was like Googling, like thinking of George going to camp. He's going off to camp. So I was Googling funny letters that kids send home from camp and I adapted it. This was a letter that George sent when he was down as when he would go for a Lord Warden duties. He sent this letter back to court. In addition to his diplomatic duties, George used his appointment as Lord Warden of the Sank Ports to wield judicial influence over those in opposition to his program of reform. The position of Lord Warden, along with the accompanying elevation to Constable of Dover, was one of the most powerful positions of the 16th century. In this role, George exerted control over one of the main hubs of the English realm and as such could raise muster, summon juries, and hand down criminal sentences. He was known to rule with a heavy hand, going so far as to forbid servants of the port from wearing the heraldry of anyone other than he or the king, regardless of who employed them. So as you can imagine, he made a few enemies. <laughs> the courtier's influence became such that Thomas Cromwell felt inclined to undermine him on more than one occasion in order to curb his power. Political appointments aside, foreign dignitaries to the English court viewed George as both gospeler and gatekeeper. Recognizing his position as a representative of the king in religious matters, the imperial ambassador Eustace Chapuis stood out as one of George's main antagonists. He often accused the courtier of being more Lutheran than Luther and remarked in one letter to Emperor Charles V, that George often could not refrain from proselytizing. Prior to that, Chapuis described how the courtier maneuvered him out of a conversation with the Duke of Norfolk regarding the legitimacy of Princess Elizabeth and kept him from meeting with Thomas Cromwell. He also referenced George as the king's representative at the executions of three Carthusian monks, an event Chapuis found horrifying. Throughout their time together in King Henry's court, the ambassador nursed a begrudging respect for George. While they often did not agree on matters spiritual or temporal, Chapuis viewed the young man as exceedingly clever and charismatic. The shock and disbelief he wrote of experiencing after George's death shows how much influence the court courtier wielded. Even his rival never expected George's fate. George made his last stand against the clerical faction in court, where he called into question the king's motives for bringing him down. As Chapuis recounts, George met every accusation so courageously, observers were taking bets on his exoneration. He refused to back down, ignoring Cromwell's directive not to read aloud one of the charges. In the case of the king's impotence, he replied, he could not speculate and risk impugnment of the king's future marriages. George would tumble from favor, but he would leave a seed of doubt regarding the Catholic Jane Seymour, successor to his sister. Despite his bombastic courtroom appearance, Letters from the Constable of the Tower during George's imprisonment there reveal a man haunted, if not regretful, of the lengths he went in service to reform. William Kingston wrote of George's preoccupation with the discharge of his debts, specifically money owed by a white monk he saw promoted to an abbey in Cheshire. After some reflection, he reasoned, it did not matter after all, as the abbey had surely been suppressed and the monk dispossessed along with it. Another letter written on the eve of George's execution indicated the condemned wished for but had not received his last sacramental rites. George had gone far in his promotion of reform, but he was not yet prepared to give up on one of Catholicism's most comforting rituals. Determined to spread the tenets of reform up to the moment of his death, George delivered a sermon containing hallmarks of Protestant belief from the scaffold. He acknowledged his sinfulness. 
taking responsibility for his faults while looking to God alone for forgiveness of them. He asked the witnesses to act as ministers, to intercede and pray for him. He spoke the language of Zion, urging his listeners to follow the gospel and avoid the the vanities and flattery of the court. He would have been spared, he said, had he followed God's word indeed as he did read it. The idea that gospel governs behavior and dress is thoroughly Protestant, bordering on puritanical in nature. Indeed, as time marched on, the leading reformers of the Edwardian and Elizabethan courts began to limit the extravagance of their clothing. They adopted serious and severe natures, avoiding popular pastimes such as dancing and secular music. Though the interpretation is contrary to George's intent, Ambassador Chapuy adroitly summed up the courtier's commitment to religious reform. He told his employer that George owned he deserved death for having been contaminated with the new heresies and caused many others to be infected with them. He said George admitted he deserved punishment for his proselytizing, and he recommended all to forsake heretical doctrines and practices, which words on the mouth of such a man as Lord Rochford will be the cause of innumerable people here being converted. Chapuy did not agree with George's beliefs, but he recognized the power of his persuasion. Of all the translations of George Bullen's scaffold sermon, not one contains the same wording as another, yet they all agree George was an ardent and diligent reformer who used his talents to advance Protestant doctrines. In chronicler Elis Grufford's version, George said he took upon himself a great labor to urge the king to permit the scriptures to go unimpeded among the commons of the realm. When the full scope of George's efforts is considered, this proves to be true. George sought reform with the books he read, translated, and shared with both the king and leading nobles of the realm. Though his sister often receives the credit, he was in truth far more effective than her by sheer virtue of his gender. Anne Boleyn may have had the superior title, but she was denied access to the male-dominated spheres of convocation and parliament where doctrine and legislation were created. In contrast, George was boots on the ground and utilized his privileged entry to these circles of influence, to these circles to influence the law of the land. Once the king was on board, George sought to globalize them in foreign courts. Current scholarly perspective tends to pit Thomas Cromwell against the Boleyns, and it is true he played a significant role in their downfall. Nevertheless, George remained, until his death, one of Cromwell's most powerful supporters. During the faction wars that followed the events of 1536, George would have been the one courtier best place to negate the anti-Cromwell sentiment that arose in the Privy Council. There were few men that could effectively stand up to the Duke of Norfolk and his nephew George was one of them. Had the courtier remained alive, it is likely Cromwell would have survived Norfolk's coup. (laughs) Yes, Lisa. What's your speculation from getting better? You think Jordan Malay's trial and excuse were worse than they either stumble at me or others? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. And I think that's part of why it was rushed because he had a lot of support and respect, even if they didn't necessarily agree with him, like Francois. And I think that eventually, had it dragged out a little bit longer than these people, particularly the Schmalkaldic League. Because as you can see, they once he was executed, they were so upset with Henry that they were like, sorry, we're not working with you anymore. We clearly, our values do not align. So I do think that, yeah. Anyone else? Do you guys have any questions? 
So the incest charge was to credit him. Oh, absolutely. We're asking if the incest charge was to yeah. credit him. Also, someone online asked, I don't know if it was for you necessarily, but they asked, how old was George around this time? Uh, they say because they were astonished at the abilities and education of the young people in the Tudor court, yeah. especially compared to today. Um, do you know anything about that or can talk about any? Like well, we don't know for sure when George was was born. Mm -hmm. um, so I would guesstimate that he was in kind of his his later 20s early 30s throughout some of these things um Sorry. but yeah and then it was actually remarked upon because when he was sent on his first diplomatic mission that's part of why john stokesley went with him was because stokesley was really a seasoned diplomat mm -hmm. and george was like he was young and it was really remarked upon you know at the time of how young he was to be sent on such an important mission but you know, he had been at court for quite a long time, it, long before Anne was at court. And so he had that kind of relationship with Henry and Henry knew his skills. And as we know, his father, Thomas, was an excellent diplomat and he was like celebrated for his abilities and sent on really important missions. And so it's likely that George very much took after his father. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It was a girl. You see, George Lennon, like, diminished his skin on her. Yeah, she had a diminished skin on her. Do you have any theories as to why he's so well perfect? She's saying that George is not. Well, I think part of it goes to we want to focus on Anne and we want to make Anne the her heroine. And she was. You know, she did a lot of really impressive things for a female at that time. But we have to remember that she was a woman. And so she really, she could tell the king what she thought and she could, she could influence in her way. But at the end of the day, it was the men who, who were making the laws and who were allowed how to come up with doctrine and legislation and all of those things. And so I think that he gets diminished in our, in our efforts to like really boost up. And, but I think also we have this idea that George was just this, you know, he was a philanderer and a wife beater and all of these things. And there's simply no evidence for that. So I, you know, it's a great question because I think the story of who George really was is far more interesting than this idea of him, you know, and especially why I was so thrilled to, to find the connection with the Book of Gladness to, to this really ardent feminist female writer and it, a feminist male writer like that is even less uh, uh you know it's more unique right because men weren't typically feminist in that that era you know and the fact that george had that and he was passing it around i mean in the book you see wyatt's signature in there you see mark smeaton's signature there he's passing it around to all of these courtiers and he's like read this because this is like really great stuff you know, it really makes me question this idea that he was like this horrible husband who beat his wife because like that just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and he's like telling people like, read this book. It says how great women are and how great marriage is and how, you know, but historians never talk about that part of the book. They just focus on the torments of marriage, right? Because it sounds funny, but it really wasn't. It was really a terrible, terrible misogynistic poem. So, yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question, but. <laughs> uh, and then something else. Uh, someone said if, if you could say something about the radicalization. And I mean, you mentioned a little bit, but about um, the radicalization of the court um, by printing in English, and, like what it was that they were reading. Yeah, they were reading these Protestant tracts that really like questioned the things that the church was doing. You know, because 
the Bible was really sort of um, only read by the clergy or religious leaders. It wasn't really spread out along, you know, to the lower, the lower classes, like just your typical civilian. And so once the printing press was developed and you could print the Bible and you could, you had people who were learning how to read it and they were writing their interpretations of it and they were writing their thoughts regarding what was written in the Bible, regarding what the church was doing. So it just kind of spread those ideas out, out into the populace. And, and it started to make them start to ask these questions and explore these changes and interpretations of, of what was established religious thought. Yeah. And was George athletic? Did he joust? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. He was a jouster. He loved to play tennis. He was really good at it. And he would beat Henry often. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, he, he was. And I'm, I don't know who this is, but why didn't Henry execute Thomas Wyatt? Because of ego or? You know, I'm not all that sure why Thomas Wyatt wasn't executed because of all the men, he's probably the only one who had any sort of close to intimate relationship with Anne. Of course, it was well before she was with the king. And that's still even debatable. Like, we don't actually know if they did have a relationship. But of all the men who were there, he's really kind of the only one where we could say, be, you know, prior to her marriage. So to me, I would think he would be the one who was, who was most likely executed. But my personal belief is that Wyatt was imprisoned to lend um uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for to to lend reasonableness to the the all the events the credibility credibility that sort of thank you <laughs> yeah i think that he was imprisoned to to lend credibility because there were already like mutterings about wyatt and Anne, and so it was kind of and of like, okay, well, this makes sense, right? But there was never any of the same type of mutterings with the other men because it was all politically expedient for them to be executed. And yeah. And then um, what was Henry VIII really afraid of in regard to George? Um, well, I think George had some pretty powerful allies in the Schmalkaldic League and in the, you know, Francis the First, And, you know, I mean, even people like Chapuy, he was like absolutely shocked by what happened. And, um, you know, he's kind of an antagonist to the Bullen family. So he had that power. But also he was very persuasive and charismatic. And... You know, I think Henry was in his earlier years, but as he became more of a tyrant, he was less charismatic and he was, you know. And so I think that powerful people are afraid of people who are charismatic and can persuade others. Because could you imagine if George had not been, had not been cu caught up in what happened with his sister? Like if he just tried to imprison Anne and execute Anne, there's no way that George would have allowed that to happen. He would have done, he, plus he had connections to France. I mean, I think in an alternate world, like how incredible would it have been if, you know, George had said, hey, Francis, my sister is like on these trumped up charges and the king's going to execute her. Can you help me get her out of the country? Or can you, I mean, there's precedence for that because, you know, the imperial faction was, was talking about spiriting Princess Mary out of the country. And so, you know, I think that in addition to George being Cromwell's most powerful ally, he was also Anne's. And he would not have allowed what happened to her to happen. And then just people seem really interested in George. Do you have any book recommendations on George? For, for uh, yeah. You want to learn more? Yeah. 
So um, there is a biography about George and it's by Claire Ridgway. I think most of you people know her from the Anne Boleyn Files, Claire Ridgway and Claire Cherry. And um, it's called George, it's just called George Boleyn, um, courtier, poet, and something like the subtitle is, I can't remember all of it. But if you look up George Boleyn, you'll find it. And then also there's a book by... Um, Lauren McKay called Among the Wolves at Court, which is really good as well. And that's about both George and his father, Thomas. Yeah. And the, okay, so the book yeah. club's covering that that one in, in November. In November. Yeah. And yeah, for all the people online, people here, there's a book club. Check that out. <laughs> it's super fun. I've attended a couple of times. <laughs> yes. Is that any more questions from anyone? Uh, I don't think there's any, let me just check. Okay. There's you have a book that you give sure. it to give away. Yeah. Trying to draw the name. Sure. And whoever wins, I did not sign it because I wanted to personalize it for whoever wins it. So just okay. find me after and I'll, I'll sign it for you. All right, here you go. Drum roll. Or as Mallory says, bum roll. Bum roll. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's really small. The print. Uh, here, let me see. Let me read it. Naline? Na yeah, no, Naline? Naline. You know what? She didn't come. She messaged me. I forgot to take her off. All right, let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> All Sarah Austin? Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Sarah. Are we <laughs> there you go. All right. I you know, the thing about why wasn't Wyatt killed in Hillary Mantel's books, she makes it look like Wyatt and Cromwell were buddies. Do you think there's any? That's my question for you. Like with that, do you think there's? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, Wyatt and Cromwell, they were close, and they were uh, had very interesting relationships. You know, because he was also like super good friends with Lord Morley, Jane's dad. Um, and I actually do wonder sometimes, like, would Jane have been executed if Thomas Cromwell was still alive? Because, you know, he would have. And that's not to say, I'm not saying that they worked together to bring down the Boleyns. <laughs> but he was very close to Jane's father. And he, he would have come to her aid. Um, and same thing with, and that's another big reason why Wyatt was not executed because of his relationship with Cromwell. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Adrian. Let's give you a big round of applause.